similarities between cats and dogs. Both are carnivores. They have similar dentition. And both have fairly short GI tracts in relation to body length. The cat's GI tract is four times its body length, and the dog's GI tract is six times its body length. Both of them don't produce any salivary amylase, which is a digestive enzyme that helps to digest starch. Both are domesticated and easily trainable, and both benefit from appropriate use of vaccinations to prevent certain viral and bacterial diseases. And both are susceptible to some of the same families of parasites, including roundworms, coccidia, fleas, and even heartworm. Some differences between cats and dogs. While the dog is what's called a facultative carnivore, the cat is an obligate carnivore. So dogs will thrive best on a meat-based diet with some starch. However, cats must eat a meat-based diet. They have to have a diet that consists primarily of meat, and they really have little to no use for carbohydrates, including starches and fiber. Cats have a greatly decreased ability to produce all enzymes that are needed to effectively digest starches. And these include liver and pancreatic enzymes, which dogs are able to produce to a greater extent. Cats are typically housed indoors for their own safety, for the safety of wildlife, while dogs go outdoors. And cats tend to be independent and not really pack-oriented like dogs. Cats have retractable front claws, but non-retractable hind claws and dogs have toenails. While their, their skeletons are similar, the feline skeleton is built to be more agile and flexible than the canine skeleton. That's why kitties can fall from a, a story or, or sometimes higher and still land on their feet without any injuries. They're very flexible, bouncy, and that's due to that increased angulation. As you can see how much more a cat's knee is flexed in a normal stance than the dogs. Feline digestive system. We already talked about how it's short compared to body length in relation to other species, how the cat doesn't make any salivary amylase. But the cat utilizes a specific enzyme called hexokinase rather than glucokinase, which is what all other mammals use to digest starch. And unlike other meat-eating mammals, this system is absolutely unable to adapt to high levels of starch. And this is why cats are not suited to dry foods. The dry food requires a high amount of starch to make the nugget. So let's talk about some specific needs of cats. Your cat needs to eat protein and plenty of it. Cats have a specific need for adequate amounts of the amino acids arginine and taurine. They also have to have a proper balance of calcium and phosphorus. That balance is typically 1.1 to 1. And they do need various other minerals such as potassium and magnesium in small amounts. Cats need to stalk prey even if it's fake prey. This means playtime is a must. Options include toys that run by themselves, and then there are toys that need to have a human attached to the other end. This can be great exercise for couch kitties who may be overweight. And just a few pictures of toys. Most of you are probably bored with this, but I just got this little ball track for my kitties. I actually got it for free with uh, paw points. Oops. Here we go. Cats need to climb. If you do not provide your kitty items that you want them to climb on, they will climb on things you don't want them to climb on. Cats need to scratch. This is an innate behavior for cats, and declawing is a painful and unnecessary procedure. We at Natural Pet discourage declawing, and your cat can absolutely effectively be trained to scratch where you want him or her to, and if you provide appropriate scratching choices. This means vertical and horizontal choices. For elimination, cats need a clean place to eliminate, and this means frequently scooping your litter boxes and changing out the litter. I used to have a neighbor whose cat always went outside the litter box, and I asked said neighbor, 
how often do you completely change out the box? And he said, I don't. Ugh. According to studies by the American Association of Feline Practitioners, the ideal number of boxes is one more than the number of cats in the household. Now, that's not always feasible, but uh, they also did research on the length of the box, and cats prefer a litter box that's at least one to one and a half times their body length, and most cats prefer a litter depth of about one to one and a half inches. Your cat does not need a space age litter box. While convenient for you, it's most likely not preferable for him or her because I wouldn't want to pee in something like this. It's like a porta potty. Cats need a stress free environment, they need to feel safe. So if you have a dog or other animal that harasses your cat, your cat needs safe haven to get away from the harasser. On the other hand, like this video, your cat may harass your dog. Oh no, the video won't play. Well, that was a cute little video of this cat basically pawing at the dog as he's trying to come in through what looks like actually a cat door rather than a doggy door. Your cat needs a safe and enriching environment. This means you need to provide all of the above plus some form of entertainment for your kitty. And this can be very simply done through window boxes or um, window perches that your kitty can sit on and look at the outside world, especially if you have birds around. If you really want your cat to be entertained or if your cat has boredom related issues such as play aggression or inappropriate scratching, you can build a catio. A great resource is the book Catification by Jackson Galaxy, star of Animal Planet's My Cat from Hell. Highly recommend you watch the show. It can be very amazing. What about catnip? Well, cats don't need catnip, and only about 67% of cats have the gene that's required to actually react to catnip. What catnip is, is a plant called Nepata cataria, and it contains a substance called nepatolactone, which affects the cat's brain and causes a euphoric or sort of like a high sensation. Um, and catnip can be used to help ease stress and relax kitties. So making sure your kitty receives the, the care that he or she needs starts with the diet. Feeding a species appropriate meat-based diet, the least processed diet that fits in with your lifestyle. Obviously raw is preferable. There are pre-made commercial raw diets that are already complete and balanced. Some examples are Primal, Stella and Chewy's, and Nature's Variety. There are also freeze-dried raw. Because it's freeze-dried, there's no risk of bacteria, but you're much better off rehydrating it because cats do not have that thirst drive and they need to get moisture with their food. There are premixes to help balance out a diet that you just simply add meat to. One of these is TC Feline, another is called Better in the Raw. Or you can make your own using recipes or prey model, but it must be balanced. And this means the diet must include some form of calcium or bone meal supplement, um, as well as a small amount of vegetables and fiber. I'm not going to go into specific details. There are some references out there if you are that uh, aggressive and wanting to go that route. If raw food is either not within your budget or is not appealing to you, then a high quality canned diet is kind of a distant second. One brand that uh, seems to be of good quality is called Wild Calling. Dry food is never appropriate for cats because cats have a very low thirst drive and they develop urinary bladder and kidney issues due to this chronic state of dehydration and the high concentration of their urine. Making sure your kitty receives the veterinary care he or she needs veterinary care. Find a knowledgeable, progressive, preferably holistic veterinarian who loves cats. There was a cat in the room, but he left. Ask the veterinarian if they belong to the American Association of Feline Practitioners. 
Ask if they have cats and observe how he or she interacts with your kitty. Believe it or not, I have come across several veterinarians who tell me they outright do not like cats. This is reflected in the way they handle feline patients. And believe it or not, your cat can pick up when somebody doesn't like them. Look for a veterinarian who will come to your house if your cat is a bad traveler and difficult to get to the veterinarian. This is especially useful for multiple cat households. And we do offer this service at Natural Pet. We went to one client's house and I think we saw eight cats that day in one visit. Vaccination. Do not over vaccinate your cat. Ask your veterinarian if they will titer your cat. Contrary to what some veterinarians may still profess, your cat does not need annual vaccinations for the basic feline diseases of distemper, herpes, and Khaleesi virus. Your cat doesn't even need these every three years. Most cats that have received at least two of these vaccines as a young cat or kitten will have immunity for many years and possibly even for life. Because many feline vaccines are incubated actually in feline kidney cells, each time your cat's vaccinated, they may develop antibodies against their own renal tissue. This could be part of the reason why kidney diseases become so prevalent in cats. Rabies vaccinations are regulated by state laws. And just to say that the non-adjuvanted Muriel rabies vaccine has recently been approved for three-year duration. Yay! If a cat is known to have a chronic illness for which any stimulation of the immune system may exacerbate it, some veterinarians, mostly holistic veterinarians, may write a letter of exemption for the client. Not all states or municipalities will accept these, and should your kitty get into some trouble or bite someone, they'll still be treated as an unvaccinated animal. Let's talk about some common health problems in cats. Yay, get into the good stuff, right? <laughs> You're not bored. Uh, OK, so there are several different common health problems as cats get older. Uh, dental problems, kidney problems, hyperthyroidism, which is overactive thyroid, heart problems, urinary problems, diabetes, liver problems, and intestinal problems, not the least of which is inflammatory bowel disease. Let's talk about dental problems. Cats have small mouths with teeth that are relatively close together, and that makes it very easy for plaque and tartar to accumulate. Certain cats may develop something called a feline odontoclastic resorptive lesion, where the tooth is actually getting eaten away at the gum line. We haven't seen this in dogs. We don't know the cause, but we know it's not a cavity because people have attempted to fill these things, and they just come back. They can be very painful, especially when the nerve is exposed. Some cats may also experience a painful inflammatory condition of the mouth called stomatitis. And this is thought to have an immune-mediated cause. Again, going back to one of those kitties that might get one of those letters of exemption. Signs of dental problems include dropping food, loss of appetite, blood from the mouth or in the dish, drooling, or reluctance to have their face or mouth touched due to pain. We do offer houndstooth non-anesthetic pet dental care at Natural Pet. However, if, if your kitty's mouth looks like either one of, of these two pictures here, they probably wouldn't qualify. Renal problems. There are is kind of a, two different subsets of, of kidney problems. Young cats, particularly those of the Persian or Himalayan breed, can get something called polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic predisposition, and they're, for some reason, their kidneys just develop these bubble-like cysts. And it does affect the function because it affects the tissue of the kidney. 
Older cats will develop something called chronic renal insufficiency. It used to be called chronic renal failure, but failure is such a scary word. It just means the kidneys are not functioning at their optimum. We don't know if it's genetic. The kidneys are damaged by either inflammation or sometimes infarct, which is a blood clot that interrupts the blood flow. And over-vaccination is likely a contributing factor. Oh, whoops, just briefly, signs of a kidney problem include increased thirst, increased urination, variable appetite, typically it's down, and weight loss. Hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism is overproduction of thyroid hormone. In most cases, it's actually due to a benign overgrowth of the thyroid gland. There's a chance it might possibly be related to certain chemicals used as preservatives and plasticizers. It may also be related to a pro-inflammatory diet, for instance, dry processed food. <laughs> and signs include increased hunger, increased thirst, with weight loss, they may have diarrhea, they may have vomiting, and strange behavior, if for instance, being vocal or more active at night. Heart problems. Certain breeds of cat are predisposed to heart problems. Primarily, it seems to be the Maine Coon variety. It's most commonly a thickening of the heart muscle called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This, incidentally, can occur in humans as well. It may be caused or associated with hypertension or high blood pressure hyperthyroidism, which we just discussed, renal disease, which we also just discussed, or it can be primary or genetic. The signs may be very, very subtle, but can include tiring easily, coughing, or odd behavior. Unfortunately, the signs can also be sudden death or distress from what's called a thrombus, which is a blood clot. Urinary problems. Urinary problems are quite common, especially in cats fed dry food. They can become an emergency in male cats because there's part of the male urethra where the diameter goes all the way down to one millimeter in a bone that goes through their little hoo-ha there. Certain breeds may be predisposed. Again, these exotic breeds, Persians, Himalayans, Siamese. Cats with crystals, cats that are under stress, and cats with very concentrated urine, aka cats on a dry food diet, are predisposed. Studies have actually shown that the moisture content of the diet is more important than the ash or mineral content. Signs of urinary problems include frequent trips to the litter box with small amounts of urine or no urine produced. The cats may vocalize or cry out or meow when they're in the box. And they can also appear lethargic or have odd behavior, sometimes hiding, maybe after urinating. Diabetes. Diabetes, the incidence of diabetes in cats has actually skyrocketed, skyrocketed in the past two to three decades, in large part due to the feeding of dry food. You can tell I'm not a big fan of dry food. The incidence is now as high as 1 in 50 cats, and while that doesn't really sound high, it is probably actually much higher than what they're even reflecting here, because who knows how many chubby cats out there aren't even getting veterinary care, because at least 50% of owned cats almost never see a veterinarian. Anyway. Back to the kitties. Obesity is a major contributing factor, as it is in people. And as mentioned previously, cats have little to no need for carbohydrates. And grain-based cheap dry foods lead to obesity, inflammatory conditions, and contribute to the rapid increase in diabetes in cats. Basically, the pancreas becomes exhausted from trying to digest all this starch, which is not equipped to do, and the constant need to produce insulin. Signs include increased thirst and urination, increased hunger, weight loss, poor coat quality. Sometimes obese cats will get poor
core coat right kind of up in the rump because they can't reach back there to groom anymore. But diabetic cats usually have a very flaky, yucky looking coat. And there is a situation called ketoacidosis, which can include vomiting, lethargy, and acting like they're drunk. And that's actually an emergency. It means the blood sugar's been too high for too long, and now there's a major problem. Liver and biliary problems. Cholangiohepatitis is inflammation of the biliary ducts, gallbladder, and liver. It may stem from pancreatitis or intestinal inflammation, which then goes up the biliary ducts. This is sometimes referred to as triaditis. Signs can include vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, lethargy, dehydration, increased thirst, and icterus or jaundice when they, the, they look yellow. Cats, unfortunately, can also get liver cancer especially if they have chronic inflammation of the intestines. These conditions may initially require hospitalization, and sometimes they can lead to something called hepatic lipidosis, where the tissue of the liver is actually replaced by fatty tissue, which does not function like liver tissue. And unfortunately, obese kitties are greatly predisposed because they have more fat. Intestinal problems, these are also quite common in cats, I think, in part because heavily commercialized diets with these not so great ingredients. So we have inflammatory, which includes inflammatory bowel disease, gastroenteritis, or colitis. So gastroenteritis would be stomach and intestines inflammation, and colitis is inflammation of the colon. Constipation, usually the result of some other condition first, and again, highly correlated with an inappropriate diet. Infectious, they can get parasites, worms, protozoans, or viruses. Usually it affects the very young or the very old. Your normal healthy adult typically doesn't get um, intestinal problems from infectious causes, even if they have some low-grade parasites. Cancer of the GI system is more common in cats than in really kind of any other organ in their body. And signs, of course, can include diarrhea, vomiting, constipation, loss of appetite, weight loss, or abdominal pain. So again, I hope I haven't bored you, but the point is many common feline conditions have very similar signs. And these signs can be quite subtle, and they may not be noticed until the disease process is far along. The only species I can think of that hides their illness better than cats is birds. Sometimes birds are dead by the time you can even bring them in. But this is why it is so important to have your cat examined by a trained veterinarian twice per year, especially after the age of seven so that we can catch some of these diseases earlier so that more can be done to treat and slow the process. Natural Pet does offer feline house calls, again, because many cats are difficult to get to the veterinary clinic. A little bit more about cats and aging. So according to a Cornell University, a one-year-old cat is physi physiologically similar to about a 16-year-old human. And a two-year-old cat is similar to a person that's about 21 years of age. So thereafter, about each year is equivalent to around four years in human life. So using this formula, 10-year-old cat is equivalent to a 53-year-old human, 12 years old, 61, and 15 years old, 73-year-old human. And again, cats are very good at hiding their signs. Most of the time, the first thing you may see is just that your kitty's a little less social. Oh, they're not coming out for mealtime anymore, or they're just not greeting me at the door, or whatever. Whatever your kitty used to do, they just kind of maybe aren't as enthusiastic about doing it. And just in conclusion, cats are strange and wonderful creatures who are very good at hiding signs and symptoms. If your cat is behaving in a manner that's not his or her usual behavior, they should be seen by a veterinarian sooner rather than later. On the other hand, cats can live well into their teens and even into their 20s with proper diet and care. 
Here's a picture of Poppy, who's the world's oldest living cat, according to Guinness, and she celebrated her 24th birthday last May. She's Actually, she's probably 25 now because this photo was from over a year ago. Hopefully, she's still around. Just some pictures of our lovely cat room, and um, this is my little guy, Howard, and his sister, Kaylee, and there's, I think, Howard on the couch again, and one last little thing I just wanted to mention that we also see appointments at Bark Bus Depot in Naperville a couple days a month, and we will be starting to see patients at Hungry Hound in St. John, Indiana in mid-August. So call our main number if you'd like to schedule. Any questions on the cat? There is a cat in the room here with me, but she's not coming in front of the camera. She's a little camera shy. I'll wait a few minutes, but that's okay if anybody doesn't. I just appreciate you listening. Oh, Lawrence just sent me a link to the oldest cat. Oh, my goodness. Now there's a 30-year-old cat. Oh. Oh. Oh, Poppy has been usurped. Thanks, Laurence. <laughs> I'll have to change my presentation for the next time I give it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Have a great night.